I'm just going to, it's one of the first things I'm going to do. And then I'll put it down. So I'll just le lean it against here. Oh, okay. You want to flash that light at me or do I just start? Okay. Easter can change your life. You've just seen a number of people walk by with these cardboard testimonies of what they once were and what they are now. I've got one of those. That's what I was. I didn't believe. But now, I believe. It's changed my life. I am not the same person I was when I chose to believe. Listen, today is one of those life-changing days. We have an event that took place in history that no one can deny any longer. But you can reject. One of the great things about Easter is this, that God says the invitation is open to all. So I know you're sitting down right now in your living room or in the bedroom or, or, or somewhere in the house. And you're, you're watching this and you're thinking, how does that apply to me? I, I'm pretty comfortable where I am. Are you really? Are things really going well with you? Have you been afraid? Have you been wondering, is this all that life is? Is you just, you literally stay in your house day in and day out, maybe binge TV watch? Is that, you think that's what life is? It's more to it. There's much more to it than that. God wants you to live, but that life will begin on Easter. Listen, today I, I want to cover, I want to talk to you a little bit about what the Bible says about Easter and how it can really revolutionize the way that you approach life. It can actually change your heart. And I, I want to walk you through it because, and I'm not going to speed through it because I want you to get it. I want you to see how it can affect your life and how you'll never be the same again if you simply take one little step in the right direction. But to begin with, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about five ways that Easter can change you. And maybe in one of those five ways, you're going to think, that's the kind of change I want to take place. Well, that's why I'm throwing it out there, because I want you to know what you want. I want you to know what to cry out to God for. Let, let me give you the first example. Number one, Easter will move you from the hypothetical to the experiential. Easter moves you from the hypothetical to the experiential. What, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, in the passage in John chapter 20, you've, you've got this You've episode with five or six different individuals and how they react to what took place on Easter. Now you realize Jesus, when he came to this earth, he said he came in order to die on a cross for our sins. And then on the third day after his death, he would be raised from the dead. Well, we're on that third day. And what's happening here is up to this point, the Easter story, the meaning of Easter has been nothing but hypothetical. It's just that, a story. It's, it's not necessarily true. It's not necessarily accurate. At least that you're not sure about that. But, but you're thinking, hypothetically, I could see that. I mean, if there were a God that's holy, a God who's perfect, that I could see how he couldn't allow and tolerate unholiness in his presence and something would have to be done to take care of it. I could see that. But you're not really sure that's what really had to happen. Well, I want you to listen to this. I want to read to you John chapter 20 as it affected this one particular lady and, and these two gentlemen. It says in John 20, verse 1, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb, while it was still dark, and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran, and she came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord from the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple, named John, went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together and the, two, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. But he stopped there at the door. And stooping in, he looked in and he saw the linen wrappings lying there. But he did not go in. And so then Simon Peter also came, 
following him and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head not lying with the linen wrappings and rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered. So here's this other disciple named John, the one who actually wrote this account in the Gospel of John. He was a little reluctant to walk into the tomb, but Peter just walked right on by and went on in. But then after that happened, John peeked in himself. And something happened to John at that moment. He literally experienced Easter. It says in verse 8, So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. He saw and believed. And then it goes on. It says, and for as yet, they, speaking of all the disciples, they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Hypothetical to the experiential. Listen, God says this is much more than just a story. It really took place. It had to happen for there to be any hope for any one of us to have a relationship, a forgiven relationship with God. That's what has to happen with you. In John's case, he was there the, the entire three and a half years that, that they traveled with Jesus and went all over, the, 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 especially the Galilee section, but Judea, they went all everywhere together. And the whole time Jesus was saying, now sit down, fellas, I want you to know I'm here to die for you. One of these days we're going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified on a cross, I'll be tortured, and he says, now I will be put to death, and then I will be buried. And on the third day, I will rise again. He told them that over and over and over again. And they just kind of nodded their heads saying, yeah, okay, we kind of get it. It sounds like a great story. But to them it was hypothetical, not yet experiential. In John's situation right here in this passage, John experienced Easter. He experienced Easter and it radically transformed his life. It's interesting, he's probably the youngest of the disciples. He's probably a teenager at this time. He's the fellow that lived the longest of all the disciples, ultimately being exiled in an island called Patmos. This is the John who allowed Easter to change him. Now, there's another way that Easter can change you too, and that is this. Easter transforms your sorrow or your brokenness into joy. He will transform your hurt, your brokenness, your fears with his hope, which leads to joy. Let's go to the next passage, verse 10 of John 20. It says, so the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. She couldn't bring herself to leave. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? The same thing that the angel had just said. Whom are you seeking? Well, supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take care of him. I will take him away. And then that's when Jesus said in a, a different kind of voice, a voice of familiarity, one that Mary would recognize that this is not the gardener. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned, and she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And then Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But I go to, my, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. And it says that Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Mary Magdalene had a different kind of relationship with Jesus. She had a terrible past. And when she was approached by Jesus, Jesus forgave her. She, she had not had that experience before, but with Jesus, he knew that's what she needed most. And so there, so it was only natural for her to follow around with all the other disciples because of the way Jesus had accepted her and changed her and forgiven her. But that's why it broke her heart so much when he died. 
Here was a man that believed in her, a man who was going to give her a second chance. And yet he's dead. She's broken over the thing. And she wants to do the, the least she can do, at least prepare the body for burial. And now the body's gone. What is she supposed to do? And then Jesus shows up. He says, Mary. And she obviously j jumped at him and clung to him, was so glad that he was back. She knew that her hopes had not been vanquished here, that she was still loved by this man. But this man had been raised from the dead. He is God in the flesh. Mary's hopes that had been dashed were now reinstated. She now knew that the one who loved her is alive from the dead. You see, God has a way of taking people that are broken, people that have lost all hope. God has a way of taking people who feel like there's not another chance for them and doing just that, allowing them to live a brand new life allowing them to experience joy. Maybe that's where you are. Maybe you're broken. Maybe you're thinking God could never treat you or accept you any, as one of his own because of what you've done. I'm here to tell you that Easter changes all that. With the resurrection of Christ, it was for the purpose of giving you life. I think it's interesting. Listen to this. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul said these words in verse 10. I mean, I'm sorry, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. This is God's way of saying, I know what you did. I'm not winking at it. I'm dealing with it. I sent my son to die on a cross to pay the penalty of your sin. Another verse, Romans 8, verse 1. It's one of my favorites in all of the New Testament. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're thinking you're, what you did is unforgivable. Jesus says, when I forgive you, you're forgiven for good. There is therefore now no condemnation. God says, I have a good, I've got a good word for you. You can start all over again with a new life. Now, number three, the third way that Easter can change you is this. Easter reshapes your fears with a purpose. He reshapes your fears with a purpose. The very next thing that happens, verse 19, John 20, it says, So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. And the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. And as the Father has sent me, I also send you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. See, what's happened here is these disciples were scared to death. They're not sure what to make of the rumors that Jesus is alive. They've heard. Mary's told them. But they're thinking, how can that be true? For them, for some of them, it was still hypothetical. It wasn't experiential, experiential yet. So here's what's happening. They're in the room, and then who shows up but Jesus? He shows up in the room, and he says, Fellas, it's me. Look at my hands. Look at my side. There was no doubt in their mind who this was. And then when Jesus had their attention, he says, Now listen, I know you're broken. I, I, I know you're afraid. But he says, But I have a task for you. I want to pass on to you the same task that was given to me by the Father. You don't have to die on the cross for anybody's sins, but you do need to get the word out that I did. I want you to get the word out that I loved you enough to die for you. That's what needs to happen, and that's what happened here. In fact, it goes on in verse, um, verse 22. Immediately, Jesus says, it says, When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm sending you in my power. I'm not expecting you to do this on your own. And then the next thing he says, and if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. He's not saying here that you have the power to forgive or not forgive. What he says is you are the, the announcer. You are the one who's out there to say when a person places their faith in Jesus, they can be guaranteed that they're now forgiven of their sins. You get to be one of those angelic beings, the messengers from on high that gets to tell the person who feels broken and, and left out permanently that God will forgive them 
if they'll simply confess their sins to him. You have the most incredible job of all, as I do, and that's to pass the word on that there is a God who loved us enough to deal with our sin and who now offers forgiveness. That's the God that you get to tell others about. That's what he's talking about here. Easter is reshaping your fears with a purpose for living. I mean, sometimes you're going to experience fear. But God says, yeah, but I'm going to make it worth your while. You're going to know how to move forward, even when you're dealing with fears and letting me, God, deal with those fears. There's so much more here. Let me, let me read to you, though, Ephesians 2, verse 10, that has everything to do with this. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you would walk in them. God created you for good works. The, the works that when you would pass the word on to others of God's grace and his mercy, God says, I've created you with the capacity to do that, with the ability to do that. That's what this is. See, Easter gives you a purpose. It dispels fears and gives you a reason to live. And then let me give you the fourth way that Easter can change your life. Easter replaces your doubts with devotion. Easter replaces your doubts with devotion. Let's just pick it right back up. Verse 24, it it continues on. But Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. And he said to them, well, unless I see in his hands the imprints of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside. And Thomas this time was with them. Jesus came. The doors having been stood and, and shut and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And then he turned to Thomas. Reach here with your finger and see my hands. And reach here your hand and put it in my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. And then it says, Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. He fell on his face before Jesus. He knew that Jesus was God in the flesh. I mean, up to this time, it had been hypothetical. But at this moment, it changed the way that he related to Jesus. He replaced Thomas's doubts with devotion. It wasn't just an event that had taken place. It wasn't just a miracle that he observed. Right now, he's standing before a living God who says, I want you to enter into a relationship with me. I've taken care of everything necessary for that to take place. And Thomas realizes how little faith he had, but he falls on his face and says, you are my God and my Lord. I will follow you. This is so important. There has to come a time in everyone's life where they take Easter seriously. Easter is all about the God-man who stepped out of heaven to die on a cross for you. When you move from the hypothetical to where it's more than a story, when you move beyond just watching for the miracles and, and being excited about those, when you move from there to devotion, that's when Easter changes you. You're never the same again. There's so much more about this, but Thomas is known for his doubting, but he's also known for his devotion. Now, that brings me to the last way that Easter can change you, and that's this. Easter's impact is intended to transform you, not entertain you. Easter is meant to transform you, not entertain you. Now, where do I get that? that? What does that mean? Well, look at the very next verse, John 20, verse 30. It says, therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. And these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. There's so many other things that Jesus did than are recorded in the scriptures. What he's saying is there's not enough room to put it all there. But he also knows that you don't need any more information. You know enough to turn to him. You know what he did. Jesus became a man and then was arrested, crucified, and died. He was planted and placed in that tomb, and three days later, he rose from the dead, 
You know what happened. And it was miraculous. It doesn't take the witness of three or four more miracles for you to believe that. That's what he's saying here. He didn't put it all in there because you don't need it all in there. Sure, there's much more that he did. But was what he did enough to get you to take that step of faith? Instead of saying, well, I, I want to read a few more miracles before I do that. No, it's, you're not to be in this for the entertainment of another story. God says, take me seriously. I died on that cross for you. Will you accept my gift? Now, how do you do that? How do you accept his gift practically? Well, I jotted down a few things here that are in your notes. Those of you who printed out the, the notes. Listen to this. If you want to let Easter really change your life, you start by admitting you're in need of forgiveness in a new life. You admit that you're in need of forgiveness in a new life. You've got to come clean with God. You've got to be willing to humble yourself before him and say, Lord, you are absolutely right. I need a Savior. Well, you start there. I mean, that's what uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, or verse 9 says. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. God says, you want Easter to change your life? Get real with God about your condition, your spiritual condition, your life condition. Honestly, be open with him and say, God, I've blown it. I've, it's fallen apart with me trying to put it together. Tell him you don't have it all together. That's where it starts. And then move from there to gratitude. Thank God for sending Jesus to die for your sin. Thank him. You've heard the news. Tell him that. Say thank you, God. I mean, you're familiar with the verse, John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's God saying to you, I've offered you a gift. You didn't deserve it. You certainly couldn't earn it. Will you accept it? And then that brings me to the third thing that's necessary for Easter to transform you. Receive God's gift of eternal life by faith. It's, it, nothing else can help you do this. You simply need to take the facts of what Jesus did and then humble yourself before him. And say, I accept your gift. I don't deserve it, but I accept your gift. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 say, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. So you're saying, God, I accept your unearned offer. I accept it today. Now, if you're willing to do that, you communicate that to God with prayer. Now, what do you say? How do you say it? Well, I've jotted down a little prayer here just for you to take home with you. You can look at it a little bit later, or you could actually pray now. The prayer goes something like this. Dear God, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He proved it when he was resurrected from the dead. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. I did not deserve their sacrifice, but I'm grateful that you offered it. I accept your free gift of eternal life and invite you to come into my life. I am ready for Easter to change me. Amen. Now let me ask you something. Does that prayer communicate the desire of your heart? Please don't let this Easter pass by again as a novelty. Please don't go another year and think back about all the miraculous things that happened around Easter time and say, that's a pretty neat story. No, no, it's time to make the transition. Are you ready for Easter to transform your life, your heart, your mind? You're simply a prayer away. Listen, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to utter this prayer again one more time with my eyes closed and and if you're there and you're wanting to make that kind of commitment right now, right there, right where you are, the kitchen table, the, there in the living room, in your bedroom, if you're ready, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now so that God can get started in you something that you never dreamed possible. The prayer goes like this. Dear God, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He proved it when he was resurrected from the dead. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. I did not deserve your sacrifice, 
but I am grateful you offered it. I accept your free gift of eternal life and invite you to come into my life. I am ready for Easter to change me. Amen. Now listen, if you just prayed that with me, and that was honestly the message from your heart to God, God heard you, and instantly it happened. You were forgiven. And there is therefore now no condemnation as far as God's concerned. You may condemn yourself, others may condemn you, but you need to know the one that really matters is God. And God says, you're forgiven. Since you were willing to come clean and be honest with me, you're forgiven. And I give you a new life. I give you a rock to stand on that will be sturdy and you'll know that I'm always there for you. That's what he says. If you just did that, though, that's the beginning of a new adventure, a journey that will be a long-term journey. And I would love to come alongside of you. Our church, they would love to come alongside and help you. We've got resources to, to send you. They will help you grow in this relationship with God. But you've got to let us know. You've got to tell me. Now, the best way I know to do that is go to our website, sarasotobaptist.com, and hit the Connect Card button. And when you do it, there will be a place for you to put your name or your contact information, and we'll just send it to you. Or we'll call you. Just give us the information there so we can follow up. I'd love for you to begin to experience Easter on a regular basis. You won't regret it. I promise you. Thank you for coming. This message was for you, obviously. I want you to tell me how God changes your life. Give me those updates, will you? In the meantime, go tell somebody else what you did. They need to hear it from you. God bless.